Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, as the, as the chairman, I say welcome to all of you. Okay, um, tonight, in the last little while, in actual fact, we've had uh, the committee giving talks to all the time. So we need more representatives from outside besides the committee. But uh, this, most of the committee are quite good at these things. Now, tonight I'm talking about Cecil John Rhodes' Secret Society. Now, in essence, um, I always think when I'm talking about orthopedics or sports medicine, I talk as an expert. When I talk about this sort of thing, I'm a messenger. Okay, and remember, don't shoot the messenger. So, if there are any questions that are at the end, um, I'll do my best. If I'm not good enough, I apologize. We'll always, I'll check it out and, and let you know. So, tonight we're talking about Cecil John Rhodes' a Secret Society. Now, obviously, Cecil John Rhodes has been a, a very interesting customer in the last uh, little while in terms of South Africa, in terms of uh, what is politically correct. Uh, but tonight, I'm not going to concentrate very much on that particular aspect. More, I'm going to concentrate on this secret society. Was there a secret society? Okay, uh, this is uh, based on this book called The Secret Society. Okay, uh, Cecil John Rhodes' plan for a new world order, written by Robin Brown, himself a Rhodesian or Zimbabwean. Okay, um, he, he wrote this book. Lots of stuff in it uh, is very interesting, some of it controversial, uh, some of it you're not sure, so sure of your facts, but generally it's a good book. So we're, we're talking about Cecil John Rhodes. He was born in 1853 and died in 1902. Okay, he died quite young, 49 years of age when he died. Um, and the, the feature was, as I said, born in 1853. His father was a curate in the small, small village in England. It was called Bishop Stortford. Okay. He was apparently unhealthy as a child. Okay. And as a result of that, he was privately schooled. Now, his, his brothers all went to Eton or Harrow, but he was schooled privately. And then at the age of 17, in 1870, he was sent to Africa, okay, and apparently for health reasons. Okay, he went to a cotton farm uh, in Natal, where he lived for two years. So he lived there for quite a long time. I hope I'm pressing the right button. Okay, on the cotton farm, he met a, a young man called Caesar Hawkins, okay, whose father was a, a bank manager uh, in the Unkamas district. And they became very close friends. I say that... Uh, reservedly because it becomes interesting a little bit later on. And they, when the cotton uh, fields gave trouble, um, he accompanied him to Kimberley when, when the cotton crop failed. So Cecil John wrote, this is a, a picture of him, a, a drawing of him, okay, as a young man. And he went to Kimberley. Now, remember he was supposed to be very unhealthy. And as such, obviously the last place he needed to go to was to Kimberley because the descriptions of Kimberley at that stage, when they were digging the big hole, uh, were amazing. Apparently it was yellow dust everywhere. It was certainly very unhealthy for most of the people. And he seemed to have survived it. So we query his uh, sickness, because they said he had uh, possible tysis, and he had possible, uh, even said he had syphilis, which he got from a Zulu maiden. Okay, so there were a whole lot of things that they said about him. Um, and how, how, often, how are they true, how are they true or not, one doesn't know. Okay, this is the big hole in Kimberley, them digging at that stage. And remember, it, so it was an amazingly big hole, okay, and there you can see them busy digging the hole. It was actually yeah. a copy that they, they worked on. The copy uh, was called the Coles, Colesburg copy, and by the time he got there, it was already 100 feet deep. So they dropped the copy down completely, and uh, his whole action there was uh, to, to try and own the copy. That was his major intention. Okay, this is the Kimberley Hole today. It's just over a thousand meters deep. It was 20 hectares uh, in diameter. Okay, looking at the whole thing, it was 20 hectares in diameter. So it was a, a, a large hole that they made. Biggest man-made hole in the world. This is a picture in the early days of Cecil John Rhodes at the, uh, his camping site um, in Kimberley. All right, and he was, at that stage, remember they all said he was very unhealthy, and he went on safaris, he did all sorts of things without any real trouble, so we wondered how uh, unf unfit he was. And the comment was, until the age of 40, he was actually fairly fit and healthy in Africa. When he went to, back to England, which he went quite ex uh, extensively, 
um, he wasn't very healthy. But while in Africa, because of excessive smoking, eating and drinking, it caused his health to deteriorate. And we see a picture here of him, okay, lying at Kimberley, and he doesn't look, exactly look good. Uh, I think he, is, he certainly doesn't look good to me. Now, he's an interesting character because at the age of 20, he was already thinking of reorganizing the workers. Uh, they were black and white, and it was apparently already had vision of changing the world order at the age of 20. He envisioned himself as a top dog, okay, as an Englishman. Okay, that was the most important thing for him. He felt that there was only one race on earth who could administer to the nations of the world, the English. They alone had the knowledge and experience to run a world empire. He realized that Kimberley could provide him with the wealth to finance his dream. His dream was to have this, this empire. This was for him was the, was the most important thing. He wanted not only to have the diamonds, but he wanted to own the entire pit. Okay, but to achieve his dreams of a world order controlled by the English, he, he, he assembled a group of like-minded young men, which he called his band of brothers. Uh, th there were, at one stage, there were uh, 12 of them, and he called them the apostles. Okay? They would meet in secret. They were very disciplined by the rules, which are tough as the Society of Jesus. Now, I don't know much about the Society of Jesus, but obviously it must have been quite tough. Two of the first brothers were Alfred Bight and Charles Rudd. Now, when they start saying they were members, it's very difficult to assess because there was no membership role or anything like that. So you just have to see, they were, if they weren't members, they were knowledgeable about the whole thing. Okay, and at this stage, at the age of 20, there was evidence that he had homosexual tendencies. Charles Rudd was an interesting character, okay. He was the first one who knew about or joined the, the band of brothers. Uh, he joined Rhodes in an ice cream shop, okay, when they first started. He was about 10 years older than Rhodes, and they started this ice cream shop because the temperatures were over 100 degrees uh, um, uh, Fahrenheit at that stage. It was very hot, okay, and with the money that they, they had, they bought pumping equipment because one of the important things, okay, is that they needed, because of the water going into the hole, they needed pumping equipment. And so he was involved in that. And uh, he was obviously a very good thinker because he realized that was the most important thing. So they, they had these, uh, um, this ice cream shop which they, where they genuinely sold ice creams. And he made the ice creams and Charles Rudd sold the ice creams. And Charles Rudd was a very de devoted friend. He was, became a very rich man himself. And he actually facilitated the buying of the land which was eventually to become Rhodesia. Alfred Bight. Now, this is, remember, this is a British society, that secret society that they're talking about. He was a German Jew. Okay, he dealt in raw diamonds, he amassed a fortune, and he invested heavily in Rhodes' secret society. He really invested very heavily. He was, and here's a picture of, uh, of uh, Cecil John Rhodes and Alfred Bight. They formed the De Beers Company, and there we can see Cecil uh, uh, John Rhodes with his, with his directors as De Beers. And the beers got bigger and bigger because eventually he owned that whole copy, that whole area. Okay, um, it, he had associations with people like Barney Bonato uh, and those sort of people, and he was able to persuade them, despite being a very young man, that they would come, should come in with him uh, in his ventures. Okay, and Barney Bonato, in actual fact, did exactly that. Now, at the same time, okay, there was Charles China Gordon of Cartoon. Now, he was a famous man, we've all heard of the, uh, uh, Charles Gordon of, or China Gordon of Khartoum. Okay, he was also, he proposed himself, uh, um, uh, at a different time, uh, a secret community of men for the betterment of society. He had the same ideas uh, as Cecil John Rhodes. And again, there was strong evidence that he was homosexual. So, it's an I interesting thing as we go along, you'll, you'll see. Sorry. Okay. Now, what about China Gordon? He was the hero of the Crimea, so he was a great fighter. He went to China where he put down a rebellion for the emperor, and as, as such, that's where the name China came from. He also succeeded in opening up the north, uh, from the Sudan to the border of Uganda, for, the, for British people. For, in other words, it was going to become a British uh, colony. Uh, he was sent to Basutoland to put down a rebellion where he met Rhodes. And, okay, interesting. They fell in love in 1881 in Basutoland. Okay, now, most biographers have agreed that Cecil John Rhodes was homosexual. 
And at that stage, you can imagine the dire consequences, okay, awaiting in, a Victor in the Victorian era, awaiting any imminent uh, person caught in the homosexual act. But they didn't worry much about that, okay? They individually, as I say, had planned a secret society. As homosexuals, obviously they lived in a secret society because at the, at the secret society that they lived in, because homosexuality, sorry, homosexuality was banned, so they, they lived in the secret society. Now, Rhodes himself formed this very disciplined society which was basically made up of gay and single men. He was very much against his close associates marrying at that stage, although some of them in later life Got, uh, um, married, got married and had children. Now, Reginald, these are all the characters of, of that particular time. Uh, Reginald Brett, okay, he was first associated with Gordon, and Gordon had written to him uh, a great deal about uh, the forming the secret society. He was also homosexual, so it becomes almost compulsory at, the thing at that stage. Okay, he was a, a courtier and became the royal whisperer. Now, the royal whisperer meant that he had three different kings and queens, Queen Victoria onwards, okay, till George the, uh, the fifth, as um, the people that they listened to him. Okay, and G Gordon responded him, uh, um, with him extensively about the uh, the empire. Okay, he was a member of the secret society later, and it also he became Lord Lothian. Now, W. <coughs> w. P. Stead was a friend of Brett's, again another character at the same time. He was a newspaper magnate. Rhodes gave him a huge advance to set up the secret society. So he was part of the whole thing. He knew all about it and he was part of the whole thing. Later he became Rhodes's trustee and administered his fortune. Uh, he became the head of the secret, later, even later, head of the secret society in England. And he was assisted by Lord Rosebery and a uh, former prime minister and Nathan Rothschild, who was a banker. There were Nathan Rothschild and Lord Rosebery. Now, the interesting thing about Nathan Rothschild is that one of the dreams that he had, that uh, um, Cecil John Rhodes had, was to give uh, Jews back their, their land in the Middle East. Now, I'm going to re read from the book, but I'm going to find get a light to read. Uh, okay, his comment, you know, he was an unbelievable imperialist. He said, Rhodes said, I intend to devote my life to the defense an extension of the British Empire. It is mainly the extension of the empire northwards that we have to watch and work for in South Africa. A very interesting comment. Remember that when you're an Englishman and have consequently you've won the first prize in the lottery of life. So he was very <laughs> proud of being an, an Englishman. Very, very proud. Uh, and you know he was he became the the, the um, the Colossus of Rhodes, okay, or the Rhodes of Colossus. Okay, this was a caricature of him, okay, um, after he announced plans for a telegraph line and a railroad from Cape to Cairo. Okay, Rhodes observed the expansion abroad, affecting employment and poverty at home. He was a proponent of imperialism. Now, this cartoon was published in the December the, uh, uh, the 10th, 1892, in Punch. All right, so this is what his whole idea was. He was going to control, con uh, control Africa. And his comment was, the different quotes that he makes, Africa is still lying ready for us. It is our duty to take it. It is our duty to seize every opportunity uh, of acquiring more territory. And we should keep this one idea steadily before our eyes, that more territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, the most human, the most honourable race the world possesses. Pretty hot stuff. <laughs> he really liked being a, an Englishman. Okay, and he also commented, because remember he came from a religious family, with his father being a curate, he said, imperialism was God's work, and I have been blessed with the gift of the Kimberley Diamonds to finance my role in this work. And in 1887, in Oxford, he wrote the Confession of Faith, which he added uh, to later in Kimberley. Here he outlined his outrageous plans for his imperialist uh, ambitions. Now I think I should read this. This was completed in uh, 1877 and attached a, to the, a codicil of his first of his many wills. Sorry, I'll just we had some light. What's the title of the book? The book is called The Secret Society. Okay. And he, his comment here, he says, I leave all my, he was very scared of dying. Because everyone told him he was going to die young. And well, as it turned out, he did die young. 
although at that particular time in life it wasn't that young. I leave all my worldly goods in trust, okay, um, to the Secretary of the State of the Colonies and to Sydney Shepard, now of the Inner Temple, to and for the establishment, promotion and development of a secret society, the true aim and object thereof shall be the extension of British rule throughout the world, the perfecting of a system of immigration from the United Kingdom and of colonization of by British subjects of all lands where the means of livelihood are attainable by energy, labor, and enterprise, and especially the occupation by British settlers of the entire continent of Africa, not only Africa, the Holy Land, the Valley of Euphrates, the islands of Cyprus and Candia, the whole of South America, the islands of the Pacific not herefore possessed by Great Britain, the whole of the Malay archipelago, the seaboard of China and Japan, the ultimate recovery of the United States of America, you want to get to the United States of America, okay. uh, as an integral part of the British Empire, the inauguration of a system of colonial representation in the Imperial Parliament which may tend to weld together the disjointed members of the Empire, and finally the foundation of so great a power as to hereafter render wars impossible and promote the best interests of humanity. Now, he was most likely a bit crazy. Okay, you know, that... Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Paul says he's okay, Paul. Yeah, I think he's a fantastic fella. All right, so, so that was basically the... And this is just a summary of what, of what he said there, if I can actually see. Okay, now in terms of race, he was actually quite interesting in his attitude to race, because the moment they all say he's a bad guy, etc. His motto was sorry, equal rights. Sorry, I'm sorry, equal rights for every civilized man south of the Zambezi, whether black or white, as long as he is basically literate, owned some property, and was not a loafer. <laughs> Which I think was quite funny. Uh, like most Victorians, he regarded Africans as barbarous or uncivilized. So that, that was the attitude at that, that particular time. Now, uh, in terms of uh, racism. He defended his actions against the barbarians, say that he was bringing civilized standards to them. And he did this with a real missionary zeal. He was really very keen on, on this sort of thing, to improve the level and the standards uh, of the black people. Okay, in Jeremy Cato, who is from Oxford University, recently, in the, full, the beginning of this book, made the comment, Rhodes has steadily diminished in reputation as moral values have changed and his entirely conventional racial prejudices at that time have become more repugnant. Okay, it's true, this is, at that stage, you know, the guys were very primitive and that's what he thought, okay, and as I say, um, things have changed completely. Now, different members of the secret society, uh, again, one of them was Sir uh, Percy Fitzpatrick, okay, the author of Jock of the Bushveld. He was a great admirer of Rhodes and he was also part, the, the, the group grew, gradually got bigger and bigger and bigger. But at the same time, of course, we had the scramble for Africa. Okay, remember that he wanted to run, uh, control Africa, but we had all these different people. We had the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Italians, the Germans, the uh, Great Britain, the Dutch, okay, uh, uh, the Belgians and France. All of these people from 1880 to 1914 wanting to get into Africa. That was the, the big thing. So if you looked at a map, okay, of Africa, the important thing is the pink. If you look at the pink here, uh, this is belong to Britain, all right? So therefore, his idea of having a, a railway line going from Cape to Cairo, okay, was a very important one. And except for um, this particular area here, Germany, East Africa, he had it. He would have had the whole thing. And of course, Germany, East Africa was Tanganyika, and then later Tanzania, and it also became British East Africa. Okay, uh, you know, the whole plan, and as uh, Tanzania, that's what happened. So this was an important part of his life. And his idea was, as you can see the red lines, okay, to have all of that, okay, and how would he um, do it? With diamonds. That was his whole idea. And of course, he irritated a lot of people, okay. Um, the one of the guys, in the establishment of Rhodesia, okay, the king of the Matabili was Nobungula, and he said to Queen Victoria, he wants to eat up my country, okay? He felt so bitter about it. But he didn't wage war against uh, um, Rhodes and his armies at all. 
they, they actually just walked in there uh, quite happily. Now, while he was in Kimberley, he decided he wanted to go to Oxford University. Um, he often failed his uh, educational objectives as he was too busy in Kimberley. He in actual fact wrote a Latin exam to get entry uh, into Oxford University and failed it. And so he spent his time, his, his friend from the, from the cotton fields, okay, he had an uncle at Oxford and he persuaded the uncle to, to get him, allow him to come into Oxford. But he only spent the summer, the summer terms in Oxford. Now, over that nine year period he spent in Oxford University, most of, he spent a lot of time at this Bullingdon Club in Oxford. Now this was frequently it was fr uh, frequented by aristocrats and wealthy men, many of whom were homosexual or bisexual. So this was his uh, behavior pattern coming out now. Okay, more and more and more and more. Okay, and the interesting thing is that, again, he mixed with many allegedly gay, lesbian, and bisexuals. Okay, and many of them would become members of the secret society. This included two British Prime Ministers, Lord Balfour and Lord Rosebery. So that's quite an, uh, an amazing situation. Sorry. Okay, what it really came to fruition is when he had as his secretary this man, Neville Pickering. And Neville Pickering um, lived with him for a, quite a few years in Kimberley. And Neville Pickering had a horse accident which eventually killed him. And apparently from all the, the, the um, biographers, they said that it just destroyed uh, um, Rhodes. He was absolutely destroyed by the loss of this man because he was his sexual partner as well as being the, his secretary. So this was, uh, for him, it was an absolute tragedy. Now, the other people that were part of the beginning of this secret society was Leander Starr Jamison. Okay, he was a doctor. He was an early member of the secret society. He was a good friend of Rhodes, despite the Jamison raid, because in the Jamison raid, um, he, uh, he uh, uh, Rhodes, lost the, pre the being the Prime Minister of the Cape. Okay, he later became Prime Minister of the Cape. Okay, now of course the, Jam the Jamison Raid is a whole other story, okay, but it was a poorly planned imperialist disaster. Okay, they wanted to take over uh, uh, um, the South African Republic and the, the Free State. Now, say, it caused Rose to resign as Prime Minister of South Africa. And then we had the Anglo-Boer War, again it's a, that's a whole subject on itself, but at, at that time Rhodes was very involved, okay, and uh, uh, with this. Rhodes' attitude to uh, Paul Creer, or Paul Creer, he was the president of the South African Republic at that stage. He regarded, he was regarded as, uh, by Rhodes, as a puritanical illiterate, okay, because he would be unlikely to join a British Federation. The whole idea was this, they were going to have a British Federation, okay, um, involving the whole of, of Africa, okay, or more and more and more of Africa. When he died, Cecil John Rhodes, um, at his funeral there were thousands and thousands of people apparently, from the looks of it, a few hundred, but the, uh, a lot of black people were there as well. So that was in itself was interesting. Uh, maybe they wanted to see him go into the box for sure. Okay, but uh, uh, he was there, and of course he was buried in the, in the Matopos, okay, in the mountains there. At the end when he died, okay, Joseph Chamberlain was around. Now, Joseph Chamberlain uh, started as a liberal socialist and he changed to become a f the foremost imperialist in his era. And he pushed for, for example, preferential tariffs for the colonies. The colonies would have first choice if they uh, getting together. Much as like in Africa now, they want to do the same sort of thing. Uh, he became the British colonial secretary and he appointed Alfred Mulner to the Cape. Now, Alfred Mulner was the most important guy, okay? Alfred Mulner took over from Rhodes, okay? He was born in Germany. He had a German father and English mother, but he became an arch Anglophile. He really became very keen. He went to Oxford University from 1872 to 1876, and he was actually there at the same time as Rhodes, but he didn't know Rhodes, okay? Uh, but he followed Rhodes' ideas on imperialism to, you know, to the end. He really was very keen on having this, uh, that the British control the world. Okay, now, as far as he was also a former colleague of, of Stead, as we mentioned earlier on, he was the political proconsul in South Africa. Later, he was entrusted to the stewardship of the secret society, which he took over from Rhodes. He was on the Queen's Privy Council, and in the First World War, he was the Minister of War, and he became an important part of that. Okay. Now, his comments, now, he was one of these really de dedicated guys. I must choose between public usefulness and private happiness. I choose to strive for the former. That's how keen he was. 
After Rhodes' death, he created the Rhodes Trust and then altered the Rhodes Scholarship Program. The trustees were always of the, of the Rhodes Scholarship Program were controlled by the Milner Group, his group control, and he was a powerful man for a very long time. He returned to England in 1905, where he continued with his secret society. So the secret society extended at that stage. Now the int imp interesting part is that the Rhodes Trust and the Rhodes Scholarship Program were the exposed part of the underlying secret society. That, that, that in actual fact was what had happened. So it, it became visible because very, obviously very difficult to keep a secret society with all these people involved. But they, the aim was to have a secret society. Now the secret, secret society underwent change okay, in 1902 with the death of Rhodes and the elimination of Stead. Stead did something that was wrong and he was summarily kicked out, but he came back later. Okay, he, They became the round table. This was the new name of the secret society. Milner made it more covert. The ped of growth was mostly of young men who were known as the kindergarten. This was Milner's kindergarten. And um, the Milner's objectives were very similar to Cecil John Rhodes. So he was really keen on, on that sort of thing. So he changed the name, okay, expanded the vision of Rhodes' world domination. I don't know how you could expand it. I mean, Rhodes wanted to own the old Roman world. Okay. He was, um, they were founder members uh, were of the kindergarten, and it was run by the inner circle, f four men, and there was, which changed over time. Alfred Milner, Philip Kerr, who became Lord Lothian, who became the secretary. He was, there, he was assisted by uh, Lord Brand and Lionel Curtis. After 1915, influential Americans also became part of the round table. And uh, things that the round table had, it controlled the Times newspaper for more than 50 years, which obviously had a major influence in terms of editorials and that sort of thing. Uh, it was the chief influence in the war administration from 1917 to 1919 in the First World War, because uh, he was the, himself uh, was the Minister of War. Okay? They dominated the British delegation to the peace conference in 1919. And that was in itself was an interesting situation because um, at the end of the war, the Germans, the, the French wanted to give, give the Germans absolute hell, starve them to death kind of thing. And uh, they were trying to now prevent this from occurring because they realized that the, the uh, mark, the German mark was depreciating at a, at a rate of knots and so on. So they felt that it was far better Okay, for them to help the Germans on their way. Okay, now they were also the Round Table was also involved with Yoni Smuts in the formation of the League of Nations, which later became the United Nations. Okay, now as I say, Milner's Kindergarten, they were handpicked mostly from Oxford's most learned college, All Souls. Now, Sir Pat Patrick Duncan, on the uh, you can see there, uh, was an early recruit. He became the fifth Governor General of South Africa. That was one of the recruits. Now. In terms of Jan Smuts working with the kindergartners, gave back the Transvaal and the Free State to the Boers and formed a federated South Africa on the 31st of May 1910, called the Union of South Africa. For the secret society, this was a perfect model of empire federation. That's what they wanted. They wanted all to be under Britain. As, and as we all know, when I was a boy, when you went to the bioscope, as we call it, the cinema, okay, you, you stood up for the God Save the Queen at the end of the, of the, of the movie. Uh, in itself, it was quite some, some, uh, something sometimes. And if you lived in a place like Primrose, where I did, there were often fights because the Burkis didn't like the Ruinaker when they were standing up for the, for the um, God Save the Queen. Okay, but as I say, it was, for him it was a perfect model. Uh, other members of this uh, kindergarten who became the secret society, uh, John B Buchan, who wrote Prester John and 39 Steps, it was all about spies and secret societies. So he was involved in this, this whole sort of thing. Uh, Leopold Amory, also in 1917, um, with Milner, he wrote the Belfort Declaration, granting Israel land in the Middle East. Now everyone thinks about the Belfort Declaration, it was done by Belfort, but in actual fact it wasn't done by Lord Belfort, it was done by uh, Milner writing with Lord Amory, uh, uh, Leopold Amory. Okay. And he took, off, uh, took over from Milner after his death in, in 1925. Philip Kerr, another one, he was, later became Lord Lothian, Okay, later the British ambassador to Washington. He was the leader of the group which were very influential in the First World War. Okay, with, again, Milner. Milner be, being there, they were all uh, um, wanted to see an end to the, the uh, First World War. Another, Jeff, Jeff Dawson, who was Milner's private secretary, 
initially he was Chamberlain's secretary. So these were all the part of the, the Milner uh, group. Lord uh, Lionel Curtis, he was the talker, he was the speech maker. He became the roving ambassador for the secret society. He proposed the name change from the British Empire to the Commonwealth of Nations. Now, Robert Brand, Robert Brand, and this is as it went on, Robert Brand himself, okay, married Phyllis Longhorn, who was the sister of Nancy Astor, okay, who was part of the Cliveden set. I like that name, Cliveden, okay, but <laughs> part of the name of the Cliveden set, which, which was important in the progress of the secret society. They had a lot of their moots there, their meetings uh, took place at Cliveden. Okay, it was the home of uh, Waldorf and Nancy Astor's and with their mansion in Surrey. Okay, and so he was one of the one of the people involved. And there's Cliveden. I wish I had a house like that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to keep it clean. <laughs> All right. So that's Cliveden, and th they had a lot of meetings there. Um, Lady Astor was a character, of course. Uh, she married uh, Waldorf Astor. Okay, and therefore you know the Waldorf Astoria. Okay, they lived at Cliveden. Um, she had a very close association with Philip Kerr, who was one of the, the important people in the secret society, in the round table. His obsession with her eventually brought down the round table. He was so involved with her. They became Christian scientists. He was, uh, um, became very negative on Catholicism, okay, because apparently he was a Catholic, and then uh, she was uh, in the same sort of vein, also uh, became very antagonistic. She was the first woman in the House of Lords. She was also an anti-Semitic, and she hated uh, the Catholics as well. Now, just before the Second World War, the Round Tablers were against the war with Germany, and they became known as the appeasers, or as Churchill called them, the defeaters. Okay? They wanted peace with Hitler. For example, Leo Amory and Philip Kerr went to visit Hitler. Lady Esther was pro-Hitler, as she was also anti-Catholic and anti-Semitic, as was Philip Kerr. Now, Lady Esther was the one that said to Churchill, if, um, if I was married to you, I'd poison your tea. And Churchill said, if I was married to you, I'd drink the tea. <laughs> famous, famous. Uh, now, so this was the progress. These people became very important in the underrunning of, of Britain and the British, British politics. Okay, and but of course, uh, now they've gradually died out. And today the round table it has a website. And if you go onto the website, it'll, it says that they are no longer, or well, they're not a secret society. Okay, so they're quite an interesting change. Right? And then today, the idea of British dominance in Africa came to an end in the 60s, when everyone became uh, independent. Um, but there's still a British Commonwealth involved in sport and trade. Okay, Rhodes' dream, as outlined in his Confession of Faith, was not fulfilled. But Rhodes scholarships okay, continue to be his legacy and continue internationally, even into go, having gone into China. Thanks very much. Thank you.